Hello everyone. We are now coming to the end of the course, and in this video, let's wrap up by looking back at what we've learned so far. One of the best ways to review the course, I believe, is to revisit the objectives that the course sets to achieve, and see if we have achieved them or not. For the course objectives, you can always return to module one of this course to recall them. Now, let's revisit the course objective number one. The first objective of the course is for you to use the new Tiếng Anh textbooks more effectively, efficiently, and comfortably. That means you will understand the structure, contents, approach, and methods employed in the new Tiếng Anh textbooks. Deliver your English language classes effectively, following and using the new Tiếng Anh textbooks. Improve your testing and assessment skills in accordance with the new Tiếng Anh textbooks, and know how to adapt the new Tiếng Anh textbooks to different contexts, learners' needs, and for your own professional development. In the next video, we will focus on how effectively, efficiently, and comfortably you can use the new textbooks. For this video, let's just focus on the second part of this objective. First, I hope by now you have got a good understanding of the structure, contents, approach, and methods of the textbooks. This was covered in the first part of the course. Where you got an overview of the course and the textbooks. In this part, you got to know this training course as well as the textbooks, such as the approach and methods they use, the main principles of teaching English to specific groups of learners, etc. Feel free to go back to this part for a better understanding of the structure, contents, approach, and methods of the textbooks. Second. You should be able to deliver your English language classes effectively using the textbooks from now. This was focused on throughout the second part of this course. For example, we discussed how to teach grammar, vocabulary, pronunciation, how to teach reading, writing, speaking, and listening skills with the new textbooks. Especially. This part also showed you how to deal with the new sections of the books that the previous textbooks did not have. Hopefully, you found this part the most practical part of the course. Next, I believe you should improve your testing and assessment skills a lot now, because this was the emphasis of part three in our course. Specifically, in part three. We learned how to conduct testing and assessment with the new textbooks, how to design different kinds of tests, how to assess students' speaking and writing skills, and how to give feedback and correction. Refer back to this part any time if you need to review these skills. Finally, we know we come from different contexts, and they affect our teaching practices greatly. That's why we talked about how to develop. And how to adapt our own teaching with the new textbooks in the last part. Topics such as how to adapt the textbooks, how to use teacher's book, how to foster professional development with the new textbooks, hopefully have helped you to use the textbook more flexibly and effectively for your own students' needs and own teaching situations. In sum, I hope the course has helped you to first. Understand the structure, contents, approach, and methods employed in the new Tiếng Anh textbooks. Second, deliver your English language classes effectively, following and using the new Tiếng Anh textbooks. Third, improve your testing and assessment skills in accordance with the new Tiếng Anh textbooks. And fourth, know how to adapt the new Tiếng Anh textbooks to different contexts, learners' needs, and for your own professional development. See you in the next review video. In this extra part of the video, we will watch a training video from Dr. Frank Tuzi in a language curriculum testing and assessment course. The name of the video is "Adopting and Adapting Textbooks for an ESL Curriculum." We are watching the video because at the end of the course, it is important to not only understand how to use the new textbooks. But also know how to adapt them 
two different contexts. We are watching this video, also because it recaps what we have learned in the past few modules as well. As you watch, pay attention to these main points. Why are we using textbooks? How can we evaluate textbooks? And what are the ways to adapt textbooks? Besides, feel free to take any notes that are relevant to your teaching needs and experiences. Are you ready? Let's start. Greetings all. Welcome to another session here of Tuesday Talks. Today we're going to continue our discussions in language curriculum development. In particular, we're going to be talking about selecting and or adopting um, a textbook for your courses. Now it may be that you're developing a curriculum. You're going through the scope and you're going through the sequence and you're wondering, hmm, should I select textbooks for the courses that I'm designing? And it may be that you want to and it may be that you won't. But regardless, we're going to be looking at uh, uh, some of the reasons for selecting uh, a textbook and what to do if you already have one and you don't like it too much. Okay. So let's begin. We're just going to talk a little real quick about that course book. We'll talk about uh, materials that you may want to use in supplementing it and then how to evaluate a book. Uh, course books, they remove opportunities and or requirements from the selection process, the sequencing process um, in, in a course, okay? Because they're going to basically have a good deal of the scope and the sequence already laid out for you in the book. So the sequencing is done. The selection of topics is done. You may have assessments that are done. Uh, because they're already in the book. Okay, so that's that could be a good, that could be a plus or a minus. It could be a good thing or a bad thing. Additionally, textbooks limit the opportunities for negotiation because you're, you have these materials in the book. Um, and so th if you have a textbook and you're not going to be doing negotiation, that might be a good reason to do that. If you like negotiating with your students, that may not be a good thing. Okay, you may want to decide not to use certain parts of the textbook because students aren't interested in it. Uh, course books also have the formatting already laid out for you. Have the, might already have parts of the assessment. Certainly has the sequencing. Those can be pluses and or those can be minuses, depending on your situation. Now, what are some reasons to use a textbook? Well, it may be the state requires that you use the textbook. You don't have a choice. you got to use this book. You're like, okay, Captain, I'll use that book. So you use the book. It may be that you have a teacher that's not experienced. And because that teacher is like, I don't know what I'm doing, then you provide them a book so that they can have that scope and sequence. Materials are already laid out for them. Okay, so you may have an inexperienced teacher. You may also have a teacher who says, this book is awesome. It does the content. It does the four strands. It's got assessments. Everything that I want is in this book. Well, great. it will be a good reason to adopt that book. Uh, and, of course, it may be that the students want the book because it's fun or it hits topics that they like. And so that might be another reason. Now, if you're going to pick a book, you should be thinking and asking questions. Questions like, what's the content? You know, what are the discussions that are being covered in the book? Okay, what's the, what are those materials? What's the language content? Is it going to cover the grammar and vocabulary that my students need? Is it going to cover the speaking and writing skills that my students need? You better be able to find out what those are. You also want to ask how it's presented. Is it presented in such a way that my students are going to enjoy it? Is it a fit for their age? Um, how are they assessed? Is it going to provide a reasonable assessment so that your students will feel confident that they know this material? Huh? Something that you want to ask as you go through. Now, if you're going to adapt a course book, right? If the book is already adopted, well, of course, then there's not much you can do about it, but there are things you can do to modify the book, okay? So they give you a course, they give you a book, this is it. doesn't mean that you can't augment what materials are being provided, especially if you want to negotiate with your students, especially if uh, you want to provide materials that may be missing or activities that you think are lacking. You know, we're talking about the four strands. I always want to have the four strands in here. Well, it may be that it only covers two or three of them. There's not a lot of opportunity per, for proficiency development because there aren't any activities to do that in the text, or there's no focus on language. Okay, you want to try to adapt things because the parts are missing. Maybe the content doesn't fit the age or the proficiency level of your students. Maybe it's going to take too long. You're not going to get through all this. Maybe it's going to be too short. You know, you're going to need more materials. Uh, maybe you don't have the right content. Students are not interested in learning how to cook, maybe. You know, and that's some of the stuff that's in your book. Well, you modify things as you go there, right? 
uh, again, for the negotiation process, as for the designing procedures, if you want to include your students in that, might be a good reason to do supplementing. You may get a book and they may say, you're stuck with a book, okay, but I can still negotiate and supplement, add things afterwards. Okay, lastly, it may not fit with the teacher's philosophy for teaching. Um, you may want to have a whole bunch of proficiency development and not a lot of focus on uh, language. Okay, so if that's the philosophy, you may, your book may not fit that. And so you're going to modify what's going on. Uh, with regard to adapting the course, there are things that you can do. Obviously, you can add or omit content. You can change the sequence. You can change the formatting. You can change the assessment. Any one of these that you can add or omit. Uh, how do you do that? Well, you've got to go out and get materials. You've got to go out and find materials uh, that are on the web. And there are a number of ways to do that. There are a number of places online where you can uh, get materials. Um, so we'll go look at that a little bit later. Okay, you may want to adopt um, other materials primarily because, again, the text doesn't meet the needs. Having a diverse set of materials is going to increase students' uh, motivation because they're not just using the same. They get to go off and look at different things. Maybe that's going to be a plus for them. Uh, diversity does oftentimes spark interest. Ooh, something new, right? So uh, also allows you to be able to negotiate uh, with the students with regard to content. Um, okay, and then lastly, you may be thinking, you know, this book doesn't seem to follow what the research is saying with regard to the four strands, for example. When I talk about the four strands, I'm talking about the four strands that most courses, that language courses should uh, include, right? Meaning-focused input, meaning-focused output, um, uh, language uh, devel development, language uh, fluency, and then also a fluency development. Um, so there should be a focus on all four of these in the textbooks. If they're not there, well, then you may want to augment. Again, another reason why. They may not be following research. And there are textbooks out there that don't. They just follow the same tried and true because they're trying to sell books. Okay, you may also be including digital materials. Yay! And there's a ton of digital materials out there. Encourages autonomous learning because you can show the person, here's a site, go find stuff. And they can go and look for stuff that's interesting to them. More autonomous learning. There are great benefits because you have things in digital form with regard to teaching writing. Uh, there are automated writing analyzers out there, automated vo vocabulary analyzers, tons of listening materials. And then, of course, there are resources for speaking uh, to native speakers online. So there's a lot of stuff that you can get in digital form. You're also a great source for authentic content. Go to YouTube and look at hundreds of commercials that are sitting out there. It's authentic content. It's short, and usually it fits in with a high-frequency vocabulary. So it's a great place to get information. Now, I say digital materials, yay! There's a lot of good stuff there. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Simply because all this stuff is available in digital form doesn't mean that you're not going to be using handheld materials, posters, books, uh, you know, notebooks, you know, hand handouts, that kind of thing. You still want to be able to use those. Okay? Don't throw those away. But you want to add to them extra things that you can do. Um, evaluating a course book. Uh, when you go to get a course book, all right, you get this book and they say, okay, you got to use this. Look at it. Evaluate it. Look at for the things like, does it meet the language needs? Okay. If it does, you should have that list of language needs. You should have a list of content needs. Does it match up? Right. Is it expensive? Right. Is it manageable? Is it a is it a tome? Is you know a thing this huge thing that students are going to have to carry around, or is it you know manageable? Is it expensive? If it's expensive, your students may have to pay for it, and that may be a difficult thing for some of your students. Um, so me personally, I want to make it as cheap as possible for my students. Um, I don't like when your students are being forced to buy those materials. If they're online, I may be leaning in that way. Even if I print them out, they're still I'd rather have them. Um, free materials and there's a lot of it online uh, next issue is the is the uh, book in a format that's uh, good for learners is it attractive for them is it going to help them does it include helps right uh, is it well developed does it include for example snapshots uh, in the readings have you ever seen a textbook where you've got the main material right here and on the side of it there's a little margin that has like a summary of the whole story 
Um, uh, to me, that's a good sign. It's a well-built uh, book. Does it have a glossary? Does it have reading helps? Um, does it have um, uh, some vocabulary tips as you're going through it? Say, here's what this type of thing is. Again, a focus on, on uh, form, a focus on uh, vocabulary as they're going through the process of reading these new materials, right? Is it, is it uh, have those nice um, options within the, in the textbook? Uh, is it completable? Are we going to get through this by the end of the semester, or is there going to be extra material they're not going to use, right? Are the activities doable, right? Can they do this, right? Is there a balance between the four strands? There are a number of things that you can look at when you're evaluating a book. Uh, me, personally, I oftentimes do not choose textbooks. Uh, what I do is I'll come to the web, and I'll use materials here. And there are tons of places online where you can get materials. This one is by far the most popular. Um, this is Dave's ESL Cafe. I rarely use this site, but it's hugely popular, hugely famous, and there are tons of materials for teachers, for students, uh, for everyone. It is by far one of the oldest and most robust sites where you can get materials and information. Uh, so there's one place that you may want to go. A place that I use quite often is the Internet TESOL Journal. Um, this site, there are dozens and hundreds and thousands of materials at your disposal. Uh, you've got activities, lessons, techniques, questions, games, jokes, things for teachers, things for students. Uh, so there's a ton of stuff here, and I kid you not, a ton of stuff. And everything here is um, uh, open source, not open source, what's the word I want? Um, I can't remember what these are called. Uh, Creative Commons licenses. So all of this stuff that's here can be used by other people. Um, so um, come on in and take a peek. Uh, this is just a snapshot of some of the things that are available here. Uh, lots and lots of things that can be used and played with uh, for, for your students. Okay, Great site. Uh, the ESL Resource Center. Materials for a variety of different levels, a variety of different areas. So again, I would say come and play. If you're going to be augmenting a textbook, if you're going to decide, nope, I'm not going to use a textbook, here are places where you can go to collect materials, or at the very least, collect ideas uh, for getting things. So we've got Dave's ESL Cafe, the, the uh, Internet TESOL Journal, TESOL Journal, ESL uh, Materials and Resources, ESL Lounge, again, another place to get lessons lesson plans and uh, activities for a variety of students and a variety of levels. English grammar, yay! Another place where you can get materials, you can download materials, you can uh, go and do review things, okay? The ESL Party Land, uh, and this is where there are lessons. Uh, most of these look functional based. Uh, but that's okay. ESL Video, place where you can come in and practice with video. Uh, what is this one here? Uh, usingenglish.com, uh, another place where you can practice with uh, idioms and the like. This is a reference material. You can go to the ETS site. Uh, I've only hit a couple here. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of these sites that are sitting online. Some that are generic, uh, you know, like the ESL Tesla Journal. There are some that are specific that focus uh, only on vocabulary, or only on reading, or only on writing. And so there are tons of places you can go to augment your uh, curriculum, uh, augment the textbook that uh, you may be uh, electing to use or that may be forced onto you. And so I do recommend that if you're going to pick a book, uh, first of all, make sure that the book you're picking uh, right, is well developed, right? It does meet your needs. And uh, also, you may want to look at augmenting it. Or if you're not going to pick one at all, go out and find materials that you want that are going to fit into the curriculum so that it can be a successful uh, component. Now, I say this as a curriculum developer. I want to have these materials. As a teacher, I may balk at the fact that the curriculum developers are telling me what materials to use. I have the guidelines. You've given me the scope and sequence. Okay, maybe I want to go out and do this myself. If you have teachers like that and you're okay with them going out and, and doing that, go right ahead. Let them go. Bear in mind that they still should be covering that same scope. and They still should be covering the essential contents of the course, the language content of the course. Um, 
yeah, maybe even the actual uh, subject content of the courses. If uh, they're in a limited area, if they're in the scope and sequence, they should be able to cover them without necessarily giving them a textbook. That's going to be up to you, the curriculum developers, and the, and the teachers. And that's all I have for today. I do hope this was helpful. If you do have any questions, comments, you can certainly post them below. And if not, I'll talk to you again. Bye-bye now. Do you find the video interesting and helpful? I hope it offers you some useful suggestions about how to adopt, as well as how to adapt the textbooks. There will be more ideas in the upcoming videos, so stay tuned. See you in the next one.